Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, today we're gonna dive into some more At and Shea, but for the first time, not Civil War content. Uh, I've done a ton of reactions to his Checkmate Lincolnite series where I've probably agreed with about 95% of everything that he has said. A little disagreement when it came to our view on the movie Gods and Generals, but uh, overall, I think he does a great job. I think he knows what he's talking about. He has a very unique perspective on it, but uh, I'm interested to see what he has to say about this one. It's called Jamestown versus Plymouth. Where is America's hometown? Now, Jamestown and Plymouth are uh, remembered today as the two um, earliest permanent English settlements in the New World. Uh, St. Augustine is obviously older, 1560s, but that was Spanish and didn't become a part of uh, the United States until the 1820s. Uh, and you also had the settlement at Roanoke, which was not permanent because it was abandoned at some point. And to this day, we don't know why. And I've done a video on that before. So I'm curious to see where he's going with this, what this is all about. I haven't seen it yet. Link's in the description if you want to check it out without my commentary. But let's go ahead and dive right into this one. Back in my high school history class, there was a great fuss made over comparing and contrasting Jamestown and Plymouth, the first two permanent English colonies in what is now the continental United States. So I'm, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, I think he might be originally from Massachusetts. Uh, so maybe that was why it was a big deal, because obviously Plymouth is in Massachusetts, Jamestown's in Virginia. Plymouth was not intended to be in Massachusetts. They kind of went off course. They were actually aiming further south toward Virginia. You'll often hear that these two colonies represent the dichotomy of the American mind. Mm. Jamestown on one hand, founded by capitalistic adventurers looking to make their fortune, and Plymouth on the other, founded by a religious minority persecuted back in the old country who were seeking a new home where they could worship freely. Some yeah, that's largely how those are presented. Uh, it's obviously, like everything in history, much more nuanced than that, and certainly not that simple. I'll even go so far as to say that Plymouth defined the culture of the North and Jamestown defined the culture of the South hmm. and that it was those differences writ large that would pit their descendants against one another more than 200 years later in a bloody American civil war. I'm not sure I agree with Over that. Over the next however long this video is going to be, I'm going to examine the mythology surrounding these two colonies. Can we as historians and students of history confidently point to a single moment where American culture and identity started? Or is it just way too complicated to tell? Don't get me wrong, the founding- 100%, and this is what's so, so, so important when we study history or anything in life for that matter. Politics is another great example of when we should do this. We try so hard to make everything black and white, to make everything specific. And you know, we love to talk about battles being turning points. They're never the turning points we think they are. They're a part of a turning point and there are many factors we love to point to moments being causes of things like we love to point to gavrilo princip assassinating archduke franz ferdinand as being the cause of the first world war it was one of the events that kicked it off but in a vacuum that event doesn't cause a world war you know there are other factors and the same is true anytime we study history it's nuanced it's complicated it's gray it's never black and white and simple of these two colonies were watershed moments in American history. But let's not overinflate their importance. And what's more, let's not get lost in poetry and metaphor when we're talking about history. The first two permanent English colonies in the I love that he he kind of hi highlighted all of those things because those are important factors. Continental United States. You might have noticed that there are quite a few qualifiers in there. The permanent one kind of makes sense. Most of the failed colonies in America really didn't have too much of a lasting big picture impact, but it may be worth noting just how many of them there were. The lost colony of Roanoke is the yep. most famous, but there was also the Popham Colony in Maine, founded in 1607, just a few months after the Jamestown Colony. Further back in 1570, you had the Iacon Mission in Virginia, a Spanish settlement, which only lasted a year, did not end well. The local natives slaughtered everybody except for one young servant boy who was then captured by the tribe and later rescued by a Spanish expedition. And I've mentioned this in the video about Roanoke, but there's reason to believe that a lot of these folks in these settlements that were either wiped out or abandoned may have gone in to live with the Native Americans and actually eventually kind of became a part of their society and their culture. 
Uh, I descend from people who claim to be a group known as Melungeons, which are prominent in eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, southwestern Virginia, which is where most of my family comes from. Um, and they claim to be what's called a tri-racial isolate group, which is a group that consists of Native American DNA, European DNA, and Sub-Saharan African. And I have all of those things in my DNA on both sides of my family. So there may be some truth there. And it may be that the Roanoke colony, for example, kind of got merged into all of that. Which is a young adult novel waiting to happen. Yeah, there were a ton of failed colonies and also lots of exploration up and down the coast. The Spanish and the Portuguese, they mapped that entire eastern seaboard from Florida to Maine way back in the early, early 16th century. In New England, they made contact with the Wampanoag and the Narragansett. In Virginia, they made contact with the Powhatan Confederacy. Then there's this idea. You see it in movies sometimes. The most egregious example is from that, uh, uh, in my opinion, pretty mediocre Terrence Malick movie, The New World where English ships would show up at Jamestown or Plymouth and all the natives would be at the shore going, what on earth is that? We are so in tune with nature, we cannot even conceive of a wooden ship. <gasps> they had Ooh. seen them, oh. yeah. Mm, how yeah, not only had they seen them, but some of those natives actually spoke English because of the time they had spent. Just because there weren't settlements doesn't mean there wasn't a presence of Europeans on the continent. There were traders and trappers and explorers, like he said. Exotic, an unidentified sailing object. And apart from being a little bit insulting to Native Americans, that portrayal is also completely ahistorical. Because the Algonquin of the early 17th century were very familiar with Europeans. Mm -hmm. So were their grandparents, for that matter. No, they would have seen the Jamestown ships and been like, yo, so we need gunpowder. Uh, we needed that like yesterday because, you know, we got to kill this other tribe. Uh, steel hatchets, uh, fresh ones, freshly sharpened, that'd be awesome. And wool. Definitely need lots of wool. It's going to be a cold winter, I think. Oh, I'm sorry? What, what do we have to trade in return? Oh, how about we don't kill you all when you get off the boat? I seem to have gotten sidetracked there for a second. Oh, uh, those pesky qualifiers, right? So it makes sense that America's hometown would be a permanent or continuously inhabited settlement. But why does it have to be in the continental United States? San Juan, Puerto Rico was founded way back in 1509. Ah, yes, but Puerto Rico was in the Spanish Empire for a long, long time, and Jamestown and Plymouth is what opened the door for further colonization of what would become the 13 colonies, so, okay, that makes sense. I guess that also disqualifies St. Augustine, Florida, yeah. founded in 1565. St. Augustine was the first permanent European settlement in the continental U.S., but crucially, it wasn't English. A lot of people are saying that in a hundred years' time, Spanish will be more widely spoken in America than English will. And maybe when that happens, San Juan and St. Augustine will be the new Jamestown in Plymouth. But for now, we are an English-speaking nation. Our government was founded on British common law. Britain is unquestionably our mother country. Mm -hmm. And our culture is dominantly Anglo-Protestant. Or is it? Well, that depends on a couple things. First, what your family background is. And second, where in the United States you actually live. That's, those are great points. And, you know, for example, my family coming almost exclusively from eastern Kentucky, southwestern Virginia, western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, heavily, heavily Scottish for me. Uh, in my family, almost exclusively, with the, with the exception of a couple of lines that came over in the middle 1800s uh, from the West Midlands of England, uh, my family is almost exclusively like 1600s in the United States. Most families are not going to be that way. My wife's great-grandparents were born in Hungary. Um, she had great-great-grandparents on the other side that were born in Wales. So uh, it just really depends on who you are and what your family is. But very few families are going to be exclusively back to the 1600s, the British 13 colonies. Me, I'm half German Catholic and half Serbian Orthodox. My parents hmm. grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in New England with my brother. Now I live in Louisiana. Each of those regions, with very different cultures, rubbed off on me in some way and shaped my worldview and my personality. Yeah. Culturally, I'm very American, but that's a vague term that basically means nothing. What True. even is American culture? Is it the freedom-loving individualism of the rural West? The cosmopolitan douchebaggery of the coastal cities? Is it the odd hybrid of West African, French, Spanish, Anglo, and Celtic traditions that constitutes the South? 
Or is it the Nordic stoicism of the Midwest? Hmm. Maybe it's the odd pairing of raucous Irish Catholicism and dour pure. And he's absolutely right about that stoicism thing. One of the unique experiences I've been able to have, and granted, my experience is mostly with, with teenagers in high schools, but um, having spoken in over 40 states, I, I've gotten to experience for myself how very different the culture is when it comes to talking and our emotions and opening up from one place to another. Uh, where I live, you know, Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, that kind of culture that I'm a part of, when I go into a school, I have no trouble connecting with students and getting them to talk. If I go to like South Dakota or Minnesota, I, I find it's very, very difficult to get students there to open up and talk about stuff when I'm talking about kindness and relationships and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's just part of the differing culture. So he's right. American culture, what does that mean? It's different everywhere you go. Puritanism that defines New England. It's all of the above and more. So with all this diversity, why do we point to these oddly specific moments at the founding of Jamestown and Plymouth and say, ah, yes, that's where it all began. Furthermore, why do we identify with these long-dead English colonists that we have basically nothing in common with? Well, as I've said before, human beings are storytelling animals. Yeah. We like it when we can fit complex history into simple narrative structures. Yeah, it's, I agree with him. We do like to do that. We do like, as I said at the beginning, we like to point to moments uh, because it's easier for us to process things that way instead of having to consider complex ideas. But I think it's, it's part of like knowing there's an origin too, right? I might not, even a person who doesn't have like English ancestry can still point to that and say that's where the history of what became the United States begins in the new world. And nobody could oversimplify complicated history into comforting fairy tales quite like the Victorians of the 19th century. It was a pure accident of geography that Plymouth was founded in Massachusetts yeah. and Jamestown in Virginia. But in the 1840s and 50s here in America, as the political differences between North and South were fast becoming irreconcilable, Americans on both sides of Mason-Dixon started looking to Plymouth and Jamestown as their respective creation myths. The North identified with the Plymouth Pilgrims and saw them as proto-Americans. They were fleeing from religious persecution, which has a tremendous irony to it, but we'll get to that. And they would look at the Mayflower Compact, the founding document of the Plymouth Colony, and say, yes, that was the beginning of American self-rule. And that's why Boston was the hotbed of, of mm. revolution, because those early New England Puritans were so fiercely independent from the Crown. The South, on the other hand, especially after the war got started, viewed their struggle as essentially a continuation of the English Civil War. These Confederate soldiers all the time, they wrote about how the blood of the Cavaliers was coursing through their veins. Yeah. Um, which has always struck me as a rather flattering comparison, but that's neither here nor there. And this does have some truth to it. Many of those prominent Virginians who led that state into battle against the Union were directly descended from those first colonizers True. of the Old Dominion. That Civil War era mythology is still taught today, but it's a gross oversimplification mainly because there is much more to the North than just New England. And there is way more to the South than just the landed gentry of Virginia. Yeah, I mean, that's so true because the people who settled Plymouth, for example, are uh, what we call Puritans. They're, you know, they were uh, from England. They, many of them go briefly to the Netherlands before um, coming back to England and then heading over uh, to Plymouth. But there's also Germans who settled Pennsylvania, and you have the Dutch who settled New York, and you have lots of other groups in there as well. You've got a lot of Scots-Irish settling the South, even though that was settled initially by Englishmen in Virginia as well. A full quarter of the Union Army was made up of foreign-born immigrants, yeah. mostly Germans. By the 1860s, Scandinavians were already firmly established in the Midwest. And while you can still see the legacy of Puritanism in New England today, you know, because of the town halls and mm. uh, village greens and first parish churches and general unfriendliness, 
general unfriendliness. War, the Anglos of Boston were quickly losing their ethnic majority to waves and waves of Irish and Italian immigrants. In the yeah, I mean, look at look at Boston. Look how Irish Boston became and New York became. They weren't initially settled by that. There are waves. And the, the heavy wave of Hispanic immigrants coming up from the South is just another one of those waves. Uh, we've seen those throughout, the, throughout history. We've seen Chinese immigrants who came in in the 1800s on the West Coast and kind of moved inland from there. In the South, the Appalachians were mostly populated by Americans of Irish, Welsh, and Scottish descent. Yep. Florida was a war zone with a tiny little Anglo population. And Louisiana, my God, Louisiana. French. Even today, Louisiana is like a different planet compared to the rest of the South. Yeah. We, and I think he lives there, so that makes sense he could say that. Had a sort of slaveholding aristocracy here, too, but those guys were French Catholic. I sincerely doubt that the Francophone Creole General P.T. Beauregard felt any sort of affinity with the Anglican gentlemen of Jamestown. Mm. By the Civil War, the descendants of those Puritans and Cavaliers were mostly still living in New England and Virginia. The folks who went to the frontier were the Americans who got off the boat as immigrants in Boston or Richmond and were told, nope, you're not welcome here. Yeah. Keep going. Go west. So even back then, when America was much more Anglo-Protestant than it is today, there was still a huge amount of cultural diversity that can't be easily traced back to the first two English colonies hmm. that happened to be successful. So culturally, ethnically, Jamestown and Plymouth have very little to do with the reality of post-colonial America. But one crucial question remains unanswered here. Did those colonies shape us philosophically? By which I mean, were their goals, aspirations, and values quintessentially American? That, I think, things, may be the case. Of a push assignments, by design, take it for granted that the pilgrims seeking religious liberty led directly to the First Amendment, and that the gold-hungry Jamestown colonists kick-started American capitalism. But that's mm. a hastily drawn conclusion and strikes me as way too easy and convenient. To understand why, we've got to just relinquish our big picture historical ideas for a second and focus on who these colonists were, not as mythological figures, but as human beings who actually lived and breathed. Let's start with Jamestown. Imagine yourself as a wealthy English nobleman in the early 17th century. You're energetic, young, a visionary, the Elon Musk of your day. Tobacco has a future, you tell your friends over drinks, and the best place to grow tobacco is the New World. Rival European nations have already had huge successes with colonial ventures. It's been almost a hundred years since Cortez smashed the Aztecs, and the Spanish Empire is fucking huge. Literally yeah. the most powerful nation the world has ever seen by far. This is something people forget, is that by the time the English are getting their first settlements going, you know, you've got Jamestown 1607, Plymouth 1620, uh, and then really it just starts to grow after that. The Spanish have been doing this for over 100 years, like he said. They, they have built this. They've built a huge empire. They've got settlements all over the place. The Portuguese are all over Brazil. The French have just founded a port town in Nova Scotia. And even the Dutch are getting in on the action. They're regularly sailing around the Cape of Good Hope and then getting rich off the lucrative spice trade. England, meanwhile, is falling behind. The only overseas land that England has been able to successfully colonize so far is, wait for it, Ireland. It's a pitiful showing, to be sure, but the fact is that the crown isn't that wealthy or prestigious. It just can't shoulder that financial burden that a major colonization effort would require. Poppycock, you say. If the crown can't pay for it, then, well, you'll just have to do it yourself. So you take a page out of Holland's book, and you found a private corporation. Joint stock companies. Like nobleman. Corporations have a future, you tell your friends over drinks. So you and your buddies pay for the expedition, confident that you'll make your money back a hundredfold, as well as swell the crown's coffers in the process, thereby currying royal favor. You've all heard the stories of the fabled cities of gold in the New World, and that whole area that you call Virginia, or the inland part of it at least, which is basically everywhere north of Florida, is still largely unexplored. Yeah, people forget when we're talking about Virginia in 1600, we're not talking about Virginia today. It's a lot more than just that one area. Remember, Queen Elizabeth was the queen for most of the latter half of the 1500s. And now by the time you get to the 1600s, you're talking about King James I. Uh, of England, James VI of Scotland, um, but Virginia is going to be named after the Virgin Queen. Um, so yeah, uh, this idea of a joint stock company, basically a, it, it's kind of a, 
a hybrid of private and public investment and support. You've got to get the support of the crown and the crown's going to help charter these companies or these, uh, these colonies, but there's a lot of private money going into it with the idea of making that money back. So it's really the perfect uh, kind of blend of both worlds. There could be untold riches in that wilderness. So you hire a privateer named Captain Christopher Newport and three ships to transport you and your buddies to the Americas. You won't find gold. In fact, there's about an 80% chance that you will die of starvation and that your buddies will have to eat your flesh to survive. But hey, you'll have inadvertently started race-based American chattel slavery. So, great job. Yeah, um, the starvation part, if you go to Jamestown today, and I highly recommend it if you ever get the chance to visit the actual Jamestown site, which... Part of it's actually in the water now because of erosion, but about two th two thirds of that kind of triangular shaped fort that was the original Jamestown settlement is still there. And they've been doing a lot of archeology span and excavation and they've found the bodies of the original settlers who, who died that first couple of years. And they've actually got one of the bodies on display in the museum and you can see the cut marks on the cheeks from where the settlers cannibalized their own dead to survive because they, couldn't go outside the fort during that time when they were under constant threat by the Native Americans and they, they buried everybody within the fort because they didn't want the Native Americans to know how many of them had died. The gentlemen colonists of Jamestown were not can-do proto-Americans. They were opportunistic but loyal Englishmen yeah. who were just as eager to curry favor with the king as they were to make their own personal fortunes. So basically, no different from the many, many other European adventurers at that time who settled in all sorts of places all over the world. Jamestown was not unique, and the special place it holds in the American imagination is essentially manufactured. I don't know if I 100% agree with that, though, because, yes, they were loyal Englishmen, as were most of the Continental Congress when the crisis that led to the American Revolution started. They were all loyal to the crown until they realized they couldn't stay loyal to the crown uh, based on their principles. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't look at it and see inspiration there, the adventurous inspiration, the desire to go and make something new. There's a lot there, and, and it is unique because it was the first permanent English settlement in what became the English 13 colonies, which became the United States. So I don't know if I agree with that part of what he said. The only remarkable thing about it, except of course for all the lovely, lovely cannibalism, is that by some miracle, it happened to survive. Yeah. Okay, so Plymouth. To get into the mind of a 17th century Puritan, I think we'll need to bring in a very special guest. Drum roll, please. Yes, that infernal drumming. Thou art like to take me mind back to King Philip's war, when we heard the war drums of the savages resounding in the wood. Those unfortunates, not ensconced in the garrison house, were cruelly laid on them, their bones broken, their brains bashed out, and their scalps taken, no doubt to adorn a pole in some even weak one. I am the Witchfinder General of the Colony of Massachusetts Bay. Today I should be relating the motives of the godly families that founded Plymouth Colony. And if you want a really cool experience with hearing people talk like that, which is how they talk, he does a great job with that. Uh, they have the um, Plymouth Pawtuxet Plantation, uh, which is real close to the original Plymouth site. Uh, and I think they have one of those in Virginia too, but it's a living history center, right? And people are actually actors who are portraying some of that initial group of settlers and it's it's not on the exact site but it's very close to the exact site and they've got got the accent down the way they talk their culture it's really cool why are we seeking religious freedom no thou knave we were seeking freedom from other religions foremost among them the blasphemous and heretical so-called church of england with its popery and finery and prayer books i say unto thee the only prayer book a good Christian needs is the Holy Bible. Every man, woman, and good Christian child must needs forge their own relationship with Almighty God. There are those Puritans back in the old country who would reform the Church of England. 
Fie unto them, I say. We New England men are separatists. We believe that the church is beyond fixing. You have to remember the Church of England was the official church of England. That meant, for example, you were required to pay tithes to it, that you were required to have membership in those churches. And, and so, yeah, a big part of the religious freedom was not necessarily freedom from being persecuted. It was freedom to be able to worship as you saw fit without having to support the Church of England. And, and that's a big part of the inspiration behind the idea of freedom of religion uh, in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, is the idea that the government, you know, what's, what's it say? It says that, that the government shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free practice thereof. The fear was that the government would establish an official sanctioned American church that people were required to support, like the Church of England, and they didn't want to see that happen. I don't think it was ever intended that government be completely devoid of any hint of mention of religion and it was completely separate. This idea of separation of church and state, granted, I'm a Christian, I've got my own bias on this. Separation of church and state is more about keeping uh, government out of religion rather than religion out of the government, so to speak. But The only way to live in a truly godly manner is to divorce ourselves entirely from that heretical church. So we departed from England, though it was unlawful to do so by the decree of the king. But the laws of the king are not the laws of God, I say. And upon landing in the new world, we found it made to draft the Mayflower Compact. So we had it in writing that though we were forced to give perfunctory allegiance to the sodomite and degenerate King James. We he calls him a sodomite because that was a derogatory term that was used for gay people and King James was almost certainly bisexual. We would nonetheless have the power to draft our own acts, laws and ordinances. The purpose being to create a new Jerusalem in the wilderness away from Papists, Quakers, Anglicans and other such false Christians. Praise God! So saith the laws of Plymouth Colony. And as always, thou art a wretched sinner. Utterly unworthy of God's love. A fountain of pollution is deep within thy nature, and thou livest as a winter tray, unprofitable, fit only to be hewn down and burned. Step thy life in prayer, and hope that God sees fit to show mercy on thy corrupted son. <laughs> that was good. Okay. Thank you, Witchfinder General. Jesus, that guy's intense. The pilgrims weren't seeking religious freedom in the sense of the First Amendment. At the end of the day, though they were persecuted in England, I mean, make no mistake about that, but at the end of the day, they were seeking a home in a remote and distant corner of the world where they could practice their creepy religious cult undisturbed. And that's absolutely true because if it was all about religious freedom for them, look at what happens afterwards when other people who don't have the same views on Christianity as them come to New England. They do to them what would have been done to themselves in England. Uh, they were just as quick to uh, persecute people who disagreed with them as they were to claim being persecuted by others. And yes, you could say that free market capitalism, which you know obviously is such a huge part of the economic life of America, developed alongside colonialism. You could certainly say that. But the core American values of you know free speech and religious liberty, that wouldn't come onto the intellectual stage until the Enlightenment, about a hundred years after the time of our colonists. No, the first colonists were very much a product of Europe, and it would take time, a long time, before a uniquely American identity would develop. So where is America's hometown? Well, wherever it is, I don't think it's Jamestown or Plymouth. There was nothing uniquely American about those first colonists, and those freedom-loving qualities we project upon them are largely figments of our own patriotic imaginations. See you next time, folks. A lot to think about, and that was really well done, well researched, and well thought out. I don't agree with all of his conclusions. I think there are things we can point to. But we can point to those things in other times and other places as well. I think there there is inspiration to be had in Jamestown and Plymouth. I think there's also a great deal to look at and to say, boy, 
I don't like that about those places. That's true with anything. So uh, just some food for thought, some things to think about. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have another particular one of his videos you'd like to see me do a reaction to, let me know in the comment section below, and I'll keep that in mind. I've got a list that I'm keeping of all the different recommendations people give me so I can get to those. Thanks for watching.